Hello everyone. Today's topic is hidden Markov models. It is an interesting and useful topic to know. It is so interesting that I would call it a scientific thriller. Markov models were proposed in uh, 19, uh, 1906 by Russian mathematician Andrei Markov. And originally, uh, within a philosophical debate on free will of an individual. This philosophical debate on free will uh, started once the law of large numbers was proved and uh, first public was concerned that it seems that mathematics leaves no free will to an individual but then the, the, public, the uh, popular argument was that the law of large numbers requires the so-called IID events, uh, independent and identically distributed. And they said that in real life events are not independent, that one event follows another one and there's a dependency and a connection, and therefore, yes, there is room for free will. Marcus, being an atheist, proved an extended version of the law of big numbers, refuting any hope for free will. Anyway, since then, Marcus models have expanded expanded in all directions and gained importance in applications Markov would not have envisaged back in his days. They are central in literally every field of modern science, in psychology, in finance, in computational biology, in speech technology, insecurity, just to list a few. The agenda for today's lecture will reflect this importance of hidden Markov models. Because first I will cover undergraduate algorithms and some aspects of Markov model design, and then we will have the pleasure of hearing from four guests coming from diverse sectors of the academia and industry. And they will tell us about their work with hidden Markov models. I do recommend you to get very familiar and on friendly terms with hidden Markov models because they are likely to be extremely useful to you independently of your field of study or work. Okay, right now, the plan is, first, I will start introducing Markov models, then I will go ahead with hidden Markov models, cover all the main algorithms, and then we'll hear from our speakers and guests. Consider a motivating example for today's lecture, a DNA molecule. A DNA molecule has two strands, intertwined strands of nucleotide sequences. There are four nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. The nucleotides can be sitting in any order, say like that, A, T, T, C, G, C, and the nucleotide on one strand uniquely define the, nu the nucleotide sitting on the other strand. If you have A, you'll have T on the other strand and vice versa. If you have C, you'll have G on the other strand and vice versa. T, A, A, G, C, G. Since one strand uniquely defines the other one, we can take just one and forget about the other one. We take this strand and therefore for today's class we'll model the DNA molecule as a string in 
the four letter alphabet, a string of arbitrary length. Now let's ask questions about our sequence. Does this sequence belong to a particular family? What can we say about its internal structure? A biological example will be useful to develop an intuition of what is a mark of chain. In the genome, the C nucleotide frequently mutates into a T. The zones where this process is suppressed are called the CPG islands. The function of a CPG island is to signal the start of genes. Questions. Given a short stretch of a genomic sequence, is it the CPG island? And, given a long piece of the sequence, can we find a CPG island in it? Let's devise a probability model for CPG islands. First, we draw the states that match the nucleotides. Since we know that D nucleotides are important, we draw arrows connecting each state to each other state. Guys, the rule remains, if you spot a typo on any inaccuracy on the slides, you get extra points for participation. Yes, back there. No errors from state C to state T. Yes, and also the error from T to C and to, from A to G and from G to A. That's correct. The graphics looks too busy and I skipped C, T and A, G. You should get a fully interconnected model of four states. Okay. And let's equip those new errors with probabilities. The probability of an arrow, arrow ST, from state S to state T is denoted as A for arrow ST. AST is the conditional probability that at position I the system is in state T. Given that it was in state S at the previous position I minus 1. There's one to one correspondence between the state and the observed symbol. State if a symbol C is observed, the system is in state C. Let's write down the probability of an observed sequence. The observed symbols is comprised of, uh, of the symbols X1, X2, etc. until XL. L stands for the last or length. Here are the symbols written in the reverse order. XL, XL minus 1, la la la, until X1. Rewrite equation 2 as conditional probabilities for each symbol in the form probability of the eth symbol given all the preceding symbols here recall that that by design the key property of markov chain is that the probability of each symbol xi depends on the only on the, the value of the preceding symbol x minus 1 and not on the entire previous sequence Therefore, in equation 4, you can cross out the unnecessary terms. There is everything to the right of the preceding symbol. For example, you can cross out this and you can cross out this. Once we've got out of the irrelevant terms, the probability of the sequence becomes the probability of the first symbol multiplied by a big multiplication indexed by i in the range of 1 to l the terms under this big multiplication are the arrow probabilities a i1 a x i1 x i yes a typo yes please right you need to remove the second a this one 
should be ax minus 1 xi minus 1 xi. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good. One thing is still missing in our present model. The begin and the end of the sequence are not taken care of. We need to add, to add a begin and an end, end state. B for begin, E for end. They don't correspond to any nucleotide and therefore are called silent states. Draw an error from the begin state to any non-silent state and from any non-silent state to an end state. From begin to any non-silent and from any non-silent to the end state. Equip the newly added errors with probabilities. A, B, S is the probability of an error from the begin state to a state S. ATE is the probability of an error from state T to the end state. What we've got is a mark of chain modeling a piece of biological reality. Now, biologists have heard that you have a model and passed your database with labeled sequences and ask to provide some visible statistical difference with our model between CPG islands and the rest of the genome. From the database, train two mark of chains. A mark of chains for the regions labeled as CPG and a mark of chain for the remainder of a sequence. For each of the two models, set the transition probabilities as maximum likelihood estimation. A maximum likelihood esti estimation is the number of transition in the sequences from the data base from state S to state C, count ST, divided by the total number of transitions from state S to all the, state, to all the states. C stands for counts in the database. There's a question, yes? Aha, uh -huh. okay. Okay. Okay, the question is, why people use the Bayesian approach if they can walk away by essentially setting probabilities to frequency? Okay, the Bayesian approach is a way to incorporate your prior knowledge. Suppose you want to estimate the probability of getting 1 to 6 with a die and you have only 3 trials. Using max likelihood, you'll have at least 3 probabilities estimated as 0, which you know is not true because you want probabilities around 1 sixth for each side. Therefore, you are advised to use a Bayesian approach in this way, incorporating your prior knowledge. Answered? Good. Put the maximum likelihood estima estimators for the transition probabilities between the states into the two tables. The plus table for CPG islands and the minus table for the rest of the sequence. Now from these two tables create a single table to be used for discrimination. How? For each cell calculate the log odds ratio, which is the log of the ratio of conditional probability of the observed sequence given the plus model in the numerator and the conditional probability of the sequence given the minus model in the denominator. A question? Yes? Question. Can you tell us about the log odds ratio in detail before we go ahead? Logs ratio. Suppose you have a table with an explanatory and a response variable. There are a group of, two groups of students, uh, students in computer science and law students. Some of them know how to program Python, others don't know. Science. 
law students no python don't no python Say 95 computer science students know how to program Python and 5 don't know. 95, 5. One law student knows how to program Python. 99 have no clue. That is an explanatory variable. And this is a response variable. Let's call it group 1 and that is group 2. Now, the odds that a computer science student knows how to program Python are odds Computer science student knows Python ninety five to one. The odds that a law student knows Python are Ninety nine, one to ninety nine. The odds ratio in this case ninety five two five one to ninety nine. Obviously, this number is never negative. Odds ratio is strictly greater than zero. If it is one, it means that the events are equally likely in group one and group two. The event is equally likely in group one and group two. If it is greater than one, the event is more likely in group 1. The event is more likely in group 1. If it's less than 1, the event is more likely in group 2. This way it is already quite explanatory, but to make it handier, work in log space. Log odds ratio. In this case, the range becomes from minus infinity to infinity. The zero value stands for the event which is equally likely in group one and group two, and there is a nice symmetry for symmetrical events for both groups. For details, please check out the math review. This is the general idea behind log odds. Any questions on that for the moment? This is our table with log odds ratio calculated for the database with CPG islands and random sequences. Here we plotted the scores in our database. Although we have a small number of misclassifications here, we have been able to show the requested visible statistical difference between CPG islands and the rest of the genome. 
Our Markov model has been quite successful in capturing this piece of biological reality. Here we have a Gaussian with CPG islands and a Gaussian with the rest of the sequence. They are this nice and tall because we also normalized by length. If we wouldn't have, there would be more spread, but essentially the experiment would be also quite a success. Before I flash the slide and the word hidden appears, I would like to mention another important use of Markov chains, not as a model, but as a way to approximate an otherwise difficult to obtain distribution. Monte Carlo Markov models as another interesting topic with tons of applications in finance, physics, etc. Okay hidden Markov models. Let's consider a more difficult question. How do we find CPG islands in a long and annotated sequence? We don't any longer know the system state. Let's improve our model. Put the two Markov chains in one model with a small probability of switching them between them, these these are uh, this is our old plus model, fully interconnected, and this is our old minus model, also fully interconnected. We keep the AST close to their old values, but also count for a small chance of switching into the mod between the models. Unlike before, symbol C can be generated by state state C plus or state C minus. Hidden means there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the states and symbols. Consider another example of a hidden Markov model. An occasionally dishonest casino has two dice. One is fair with equal probabilities for each side this die and another die is loaded with one side heavier which makes the side 6 to come out half of the times one half probability the casino won't tell you won't tell you which die they're using and therefore the system state is hidden and they don't switch the dice frequently, the switching probabilities are quite small. Formally, a hidden Markov model is a quadruple. Pi is the state sequence, where pi i denotes the ith state in the path. A, K, L's are the transition probabilities. A zero k's are the initial probabilities, and E k of b's are the probabilities to emit symbol b in state k. Let's see hidden Markov models as generative models that emit sequences. In order to generate random sequences of rows from the model, the state, state pi i is chosen according to initial probabilities a0i and then an observation is emitted according to e pi 1, emission probabilities for the state pi 1. Then a new state pi 2 is chosen ac according to transitional probabilities a pi 1i and so on. Let's write down the joint probability of an observed sequence x and a state sequence pi in a hidden Markov model. This equation is basically what we've had for a simple Markov chain, except that there's a new term, this guy. E pi i of x i. The probability to emit the symbol xi in state pi. For a simple Markov model, this term equals to 1 due to a 1 to 1 correspondence between the observed symbol and the state. 
Suppose we want to find the most probable path through the sequence. Such pi asterisk that this pi maximizes the probability of the observed sequence. It can be found recursively. The algorithm to do it is the VW algorithm. VK of i is the probability of the most probable path ending in state k with observation xi. Suppose VK of i is known for each k, then the probability can be calculated for the next observation xi plus 1. This recursive equation is the heart of the Viterbi algorithm. In recursion, one step of the procedure involves invoking the procedure itself. To calculate V I of i plus 1, you need V of i. For each state L, calculate the VTOB value as a product of the probability to emit the observed symbol xi plus 1, this, in that state L, multiplied by the maximum value for the product of um, VKI the VW value at the previous position i for some state k and AKL the error probability from that previous state k to state L. The VW is based on a recursive equation in place of brute force and computationally intractable enumeration of all possible paths. By the way, this type of algorithm design is called dynamic programming and is based on recursion. The steps of the VTOB algorithm are as follows. Initialization. Start at position zero before the first symbol of the sequence in a silent begin state. Recursion. From the first to last position in the sequence Recursively calculate VL of i by the equation we've just talked about. And then set a backward pointer, point to transition at position i from L, PTRAL, to the state K which maximizes the product of VK I minus 1 and AKL. Termination. Once the end of the observed sequence has been reached, terminate. Then, trace back. From position L to 1, Trace back the states to which the pointers were set and return the revoked state sequence. An implementation note. Multiplying probabilities in VTOB, as well as other algorithms we are going to see today, yields very small numbers and that will give underflow errors. An underflow error is a non-zero result so close to zero that it cannot be expressed as a normalized floating number. To avoid this problem, do it in log space. Multiplication becomes sums and you get reasonable numbers. If you don't plan to program the VTOB yourself, you can do it in MATLAB. Check out the scripts from the diploma project of Faustino Teo, who will present his work on airplane trajectories for today's class. 
Let's check whether the VTOB works for a database with CPG islands. The V values were obtained and put into the table. This is the begin state, all the states, the sequence CGCG. The model has been trained on the database the biologist gave us. And the shortest path the VTOB got is this one. The states, the sequence is recognized as a CPG island. C plus, G plus, C plus, G plus. If we would have applied the VTOB to a longer sequence, there would be switches between the plus and the minus. But this guy is short and it, is, it has been recognized as being part of the island. Let's investigate the casino with the VTOB algorithm. We went to the casino and recorded the outcome of 300 rows. We don't know whether they resulted from a fair or a loaded die, but we already have a hidden Markov model of the casino. We have run the VTOB algorithm and it output the following results. This is the rows we recorded. The second line is the truth only the casino knows whether the loaded or a fair die was used for that row and the third line is the VTOB prediction. There are some mismatches in the alignment, small ones, but on the whole the VTOB algorithm has recovered the state fairly well. A twin brother of the VTOB is the forward algorithm. It calculates the probability of an observed sequence for, the H, for a hidden Markov model. The VTOB algorithm implicitly assumes that the only path with significant probability is pi asterisk. But there are several paths that can give rise to the same sequence x. Add up the probabilities over all pi's to obtain a full probability of the observed sequence. For that, we need to replace maximization in VTOB with sums. This is the VTOB equation. Denote this new variable f l f for forward. Put and in in place of max put a summation. Put this equation 12 into a box because it will be the equation for the forward algorithm. The forward algorithm. The initialization step is the same as in the VTOB except that you remain V into F. Recursion step is exactly like in the VTOB except that you have a new equation and you don't need to trace back the best path. You terminate in the end silent state and return the probability of the observed sequence for the hidden Markov model. Anyone can spot any inaccuracy? Right, big X. Great, let's continue. Let's ask further questions about our sequence. What is the most probable state for an observation xi? Which is the probability that the observation xi can come from state k given the observed sequence? These questions are connected to posterior probability of state k at time i given the observed sequence x. Let's write down the joint probability of the sequence X and state K at position I as a product of two events. The first event 
is having the first part of the observed sequence x1, x2 until xi and that the system is in state k at position i. The second event is having the rest of the observed sequence after the i-th position given the first part of the sequence and that the system is in state k at position i. If you stare long enough at the first term, you'll recognize a forward variable in it, fk of i. Now look at the second term. Some terms are irrelevant. These guys are irrelevant. Because in Markov process, the future depends only on the preceding state k. Cross out the unnecessary terms and call the remainder of the second term as bk of i. This bk of i can be calculated recursively analogously to the forward variable. The backward algorithm is a twin brother of the forward algorithm with the difference that it starts at the end of the sequence, not at the beginning, and has a backward recursion from L to 1 instead of from 1 to L. Initialization. Start at the end of the sequence bk of l have probabilities of a k0 recursion step not from 1 to l but the other way around l minus 1 to 1 the backward the backward recursion also has i and i plus 1 swapped compared to the forward variable, there you had i plus 1 here and i here. The termination step. Terminate at the beginning of the sequence and return the probability of the observed sequence, px. Yes, very good, big x, not small x, p of the observed sequence. When many different paths have the same probability, have almost the same probability as the most probable one, it is not justified to consider only the, only the pi asterisk. Alternatively, a locally best pi hat i can be used in place of pi asterisk i. It is when we are interested in the state assignment at a particular point i. argmax returns such k that maximizes this value. The state sequence is denoted by pi hat i, may not be particularly likely as a path through the entire model. Let's experimentally compare the performance of the Viterbi and the posterior decoding on our CPG database. We can find the most probable path through the model. When this path goes through the plus states, a CPG island is predicted. Our validation data is 41 sequences, each with a putative CPG island. We feed it to the Viterbi and it outputs the results. All the islands have been found except for two, called false negatives. The term false negative suggests that the samples belong to the plus class. They are islands, they are positive, but they have been classified as a non-island, the minus class. And 121 new, new CPG islands have been predicted these sam misclassified samples are called false positives. 
False positive means that the samples are in fact from the minus class but have been predicted as the plus class. Then we take a post-processing step. The post-processing step is taken in order to avoid some of the errors via benefiting from the knowledge about the problem. Which kind of post-processing you, you are going to use should be decided on the validation set. You can't check anything on the test set. That would be data snooping. We have the main knowledge about the length of CPG islands. We know that th they are around 1,000 nucleotides, whereas the predicted ones are short. Therefore, we decided to concatenate predictions less than 500 bases apart and to disregard predictions shorter than 500. The results of post-processing are Two false po negatives persist, and the number of false positives drops from 121 to 67. Prediction of the CPG using posterior decoding. Under the, uh, under the same experimental settings, same data set, same training set, the results with posterior decoding are two false negatives and uh, 236 false positives. The posterior decoding predicts even shorter length substrings as islands. We apply the same type of post-processing. The validation results after post-processing is the two false negatives persist and the number of false positives drop to 83. Analysis of our validation results. We have decided on the model para parameters for future experiments, and it seems that Viterbi is more suitable for the prediction of CPG islands than posterior decoding, and we also have decided on the type of post processing we are going to do. Now we have seen the main algorithms and even have compared, validated them experimentally. But we still don't know where does the HMM, the hidden Markov model itself come from. That is, what states are there and how they are connected, as well as how to find values for transition and emission probabilities. Suppose we have a data set with training sequences x1 to xn. Assume they are independent. The log probability of the training set is written as the log of conditional probability of x1 to xn given theta. Theta is the entire set of parameters of the model, which are all transition probabilities and all the emission probabilities. If we have a set of genomic sequences in which CPG are already labeled, we can use the max likelihood estimations for transmission and emission probabilities the way we did for the Markov chain in the beginning of the class. But let's consider a harder case when the sequences are unlabeled. When we cannot use max likelihood to estimate AKL and EK of B, we can still estimate them by taking their expected value as an estimate. Consider the conditional probability of passing from state K at position I to state L at position I plus 1, given sequence X and the model parameters theta. The 
the numerator of this guy is the joint probability where fk is the probability of the first part of x from 0 to ith position. The akl el of xi plus 1, the middle term, takes care of transition from position i to position i plus 1. And finally, bl of i plus 1 is from position i plus 1 to the end of the sequence. And you recognize the forward variable and the backward variable. From equation 17, we can get the expected number of times that AKL is used by summing over all positions and all training sequences. Summing over all positions in, the, in a sequence and summing over all training sequences. Let's denote this as big A K L, the expected number. Analogously, we can get the expected number of times B appears in state K, denoted as big A K of B. In this case, we sum over all, the position, uh, all those positions I for which the emitted symbol is B. These estimations from equation 18 and 19 are used in the Baumwelsch algorithm. Let's get some intuition first about the Baumwelsch algorithm. It estimates the transition and emission probabilities by considering probable paths th through training sequences using the current values of AKL and EKB, the current values of emission and uh, transition probabilities. And these values are updated using the max likelihood equation. The process is iterated until a stopping criterion is reached. The initialization step. Peak arbitrary model parameters. The recurrence step. Set all the big values of A and E to zero. For each sequence in the training set, firstly, calculate the forward variable fk of i for the current sequence using the forward algorithm. Secondly, calculate bk of i for the current sequence using the backward algorithm. Thirdly, add the contribution of the sequence to the big A and E. Once you've processed the training set, calculate the new model parameters with max likelihood. Calculate the new log likelihood of the model. The termination step. Stop if change in log likelihood has been less than some predefined threshold or the maximum number of iterations has been exceeded. The process will converge to one of the local maximi, which one depends on the starting values. There is an alternative to the Baum Welsh training. Follow the same procedure but use the V2B algorithm, which converges precisely since assignment of paths is a discrete process and parameters depend on paths completely. But there's always a price, and in this case, mm, the price is that the V2B maximizes the conditional probability of the training set given the parameters of the model and the most probable paths for the sequences in the training set, wh while the Baum Welsh maximizes a more direct goal, the conditional probability of the training set given the parameters of the model theta. Therefore, the Vital B tends to perform less well. Let's 
try the bound Welsh to check out the casino. Say we have 300 rows. The true distribution of probabilities only the casino knows is as follows. There is a fair die and a loaded die. A loaded die with probability one half for the side six and one tenth for any other side. A bound Welsh estimations have not come very close to the original. Maybe it would help to have a bigger training set. Let's make it 100 times bigger. 30,000 rolls. Now our bound Welsh estimations have come quite close to the correct ones. If the data is unlabeled, unlabeled and therefore we can't use max likelihood estimations for the transition and emission probabilities we still can estimate them with the bound Welsh that's the bottom like bottom line we're taking from this experiment last question remains how do I know my models topology that is which states are there and how they are interconnected Successful models are an interpretation of our domain knowledge. Although it is tempting to start with a fully connected model and let the system find out for itself, that almost never works in practice. The less constrained the model is, the more severe the local maximum problem becomes. The math if the same, if not all the transition, not all transitions are possible. To disable a transition you s from state K to state L, you simply set A K L to zero. So now, once we've heard about hidden Markov models, we are going to see four applications. And the first one is the work of a student, his uh, diploma project. He, uh, he has been working with real data in a critical application of uh, plane control and plane trajectories in a big industrial project between the company called Eura Control and the University uh, Carlos III de Madrid. Faustino Teo, his advisor is uh, Professor Jesus Garcia Herrero, also co-advised by me as a junior co-advisor. Co Faustino. Con modelos ocultos de Markov. Primero, antes de empezar a trabajar Time series classification with hidden Markov models. I have classified real-life plane trajectories into three classes, going straight, turning left, and turning right. My modeling idea was as follows. The trajectories are represented in the 2D coordinates. The first trajectory is a loop, and the other one is an L shape. Vamos a realizar una serie de preprocesamiento de los datos. Primero vamos a coger cada punto de la trayectoria y vamos a unirlos con In order to be able to pass the data to the VTB algorithm, there is a data preprocessing step in which firstly the, point of the points of the trajectory are represented as angles of the left and finally the trajectory is represented as a sequence of differences of angle value on the right. I map angle differences into three classes. Class 1 is values close to zero. Class 2 is big positive values. Class 3 is big negative values. The trajectories are finally represented as input sequences in a three layers. The problem has three recognition classes, going straight, turning left and turning right. Above on the right we have the plane turning left. In the lower right corner we have the plane going straight.
eh, la siguiente, una vez que hemos controlado esto, la siguiente transparencia to hemos carry out eh, the classification I used the Viterbi algorithm, the algorithm. Eh, first I did the experiment under the controlled settings on simulated data with a controlled de degree of de noise to decide which eh, type of post processing is necessary given a realistic degree of noise added the recognition of the unpreprocessed data has turned out to be non-feasible. Uh, the third column demonstrates it, 30% of the recognition accuracy only. Therefore, I applied a pre-processing step which implements the Kalman filter in order to reduce the noise. The recognition accuracy with the pre-processing step is the last column and it's quite a success. Once the experiment has come out to be uh, a success under the controlled settings, I could go ahead and check the system on the real data. Eh, y a ver si funciona la clasificación de la Here you have eh, aquí tenemos the real trajectories, reales, turns and loops and going straight. Hipódromos y rectas. Y para la, clasi y para la clasificación realizamos el mismo proceso. The classification step este implements the Viterbi algorithm and the results are encoded in color. Blue for turning left, pink for turning right, and red for going straight. The overall results are quite good except for few noisier than usual trajectories. An example of such a trajectory is shown in the right upper corner where parts of an almost straight line has been classified as turns. Simplemente tenemos algunos fallos en las zonas donde mayor ruido existe y la For more details, no please download my diploma project. Los datos obtenidos han sido muy satisfactorios. Is Ana Rojas, head of computational biology and bioinformatics group in the Institute of Biomedicine of Sevilla. Ana, thanks for coming. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. And today I'm going to talk about a very, very basic uh, concept, which is the use of hidden Markov models in biology. So I will not get into very deep details about uh, what hidden Markov models are, because I know somebody else is going to do that. But I will give you a small view at a glance about uh, particular problems in biology that you might find interesting. So before I do that, I will, I will like to provide you a small note about proteins. Proteins are biological components that comes from the translation of DNA, which are based on ATGC pairs, OK? And uh, these proteins have three-dimensional structures which allow these proteins to function properly in the, uh, in the cell. I also would like to mention that proteins are built on functional blocks, okay? And these functional blocks, which I am representing here as color blocks, they do have uh, non-functions and they also do have sometimes three-dimensional structure that allows them to perform different functional uh, properties within the cell. I will also like to give you a small note about sequence similarity. Sequence similarity is the mathematical way we try to establish evolutionary relationships regarding sequences, okay? So if you want to compare a particular protein among two different organisms, you need to establish a metric or a mathematical system in which you can more or less decide how similar these two organisms are. So I will only mention two of them, pairways-based methods, which are called BLAST, FASTA, and so on. There are many of them. Those are very good for sequences that are very similar, or they have evolved very, very little, OK? And uh, for instance, if you are comparing a mouse with a human, then this is the thing, the method that you will use. However, evolution has been on the fray for many, 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 many millions of years. And sometimes the signal of similarity between two sequences is lost. So this is why we use profile-based methods or hidden Markov models, okay? 
So these models are good for sequences that have been evolving for a long time, okay, or that they are very difficult to identify using uh, pairs-ways methods. Now I get into the point of this very short talk in which uh, I would like to present here some biological problems that may use of HMMs in a protein characterization, for instance, that will be the first point. We want to identify poten potential regions within a protein that we don't know what is this protein doing in uh, proteins that are not well characterized, okay? And the second thing that we have, uh, we want to identify functions, distributions in unknown genomes. So now with all this uh, leverage of data from genome sequencing projects, uh, we are getting lots, lots, lots of genomic data. We need to know more or less what is the distribution of potential functions in these organisms because we cannot address experimentally all of them. This is why we need to use bioinformatics and computational biology approaches. Uh, we have been working extensively in these problems, and I am showing here some of our publications, but I will only focus on these two. So the first one, that is, we want to identify these uh, potential regions in proteins that we know, that we know, for instance, this is a protein-protein interaction domain, this is a chromatin interaction domain, but we don't know anything about the black part of the N-terminal region, which is a substantial part of the protein, but we don't know its function. So what would, what, what can we do? First of all, what you need to do is to get a multiple sequence alignment of these proteins. I will not get into detail, but basically what you do is get in this part, try to get the corresponding part in a bunch of organisms, mouse, uh, rat, uh, chicken, frogs, and so on. And from this multiple sequence alignment, you can consider it like different distributions of amino acids within a particular position, you build an HMM profile, okay? That will be the representation of an HMM profile. And with this HMM profile, which basically what you are doing is try to represent the biological multiple sequence alignment into a mathematical framework, you can use this information in order to screen in different places, different databases. So here what I am showing is the HMM from an alignment of five sequences that are represented here with three positions. So the first position will be cysteine, okay? They will correspond with these bars. Each bar, each black bar here represents the frequency of emission of a given amino acid in this particular position. The second position, then you can see like a large variability in amino acid distribution. So this can be reflected here. While the third position, you have a distribution of very similar biophysically speaking uh, amino acids. And then you can see the different distributions of each particular amino acid in this bar. Of course, we have to consider that a residue has been lost, has been inserted, and so on. And these kind of events that are very, very important in evolution have emission trans uh, probabilities. And this is calculated by these arrows here. So you will have insertion here, you will have a match state, and then you will have a deletion state. Those are the only ones that they do not emit, uh, they, you cannot calculate emission probabilities. So the take home message here is that we use this because it contains more information by position than a single sequence. And this increases our reach or power to reach similarities to detect distant homologies, uh, homologies in um, very weird organisms. This is a particular example. Imagine that uh, this is this protein called SP100, that we don't know anything about this uh, in terminal region. We build an HMM, search with this HMM against databases, Uniprot and so on, and then we found some proteins. You can do exactly the same, but instead of using uh, sequences, you can use profiles. So you are using profile versus profile search. This increases much more the reach to detect and identify very, very distant uh, relationships. And uh, imagine that in the first case, we can uh, find a set of proteins that contain a non-functional domain called CART, okay? And we found this protein, among others. And using the other way, the profile version, 
we can find protein three-dimensional structures containing an unfunctional domain, which is called GAR. So we have the same thing in two independence methods, okay? But the very, very important thing here is that our findings have to be reciprocal. So if you use the things that you have found and repeat the process, then you have to be capable to find S100 or any of the homologs that uh, were generated in the multiple sequence alignment at reliable E values. And now I will move into the second part, which is we want to identify functions, distributions in several genomes. And as an example, I am pointing here the analysis of protein signaling modules in bacteria, which is a protein signaling module. So cells have a very, very particular ways to transmit information among different components. And uh, I will show here kinases, which is a phosphorylation-based uh, method, phosphatases that reverse this phosphorylation, ubiquitinases that mark or label proteins either for degradation or for transcriptional activation, and G-domain proteins, which are proteins very, very important for signaling processes. And uh, in this case, what we do is we retrieve hidden Markov models from databases, like PFAM, for instance, and uh, you can retrieve 100-something kinases, one which is supposed to be specific of eukaryotic uh, anim um, organisms, not bacteria, for instance, nor archaea, phosphatases, 59, and a g-domain that you can compile because uh, you have to look for a particular specific g-domain. You can screen all the sets of hidden Markov models against 48 prokaryotic proteomes. This is what we did. And then you can compare the distribution and comparison. And the, this will give you some insights regarding the function uh, uh, in terms of signaling of these uh, organisms. So this here, what I am representing, is some data that we publish. Uh, you have a lot of bacterial species here and archaea. Archaea are not bacteria, OK? And then here, I am representing the relative density of kinases, phosphatases, and GTPases. And in red, what I am plotting here, is the kinase, which is a specific of eukaryotic lineages. What you can see here is in this group, which is called Plantomycetes, a very, very strange bacteria, and other Plantomycetes, OK? This is a group of Plantomycetes that shows as, uh, as an expansion of eukaryotic serine-threonine kinases, OK? So this is very unexpected, because these guys are supposed not to have this kind of signaling module, OK? And then when you check if this is significant and you compare, then th those are the p-values, OK? And then you can see that the density of these uh, serine-threonine kinases, which are the eukaryotic uh, kinases, are uh, significantly enriched in this group as compared to the archaea, to other uh, PVCs or to other eubacteria. And then we can see a significant depletion of this. So this is just an illustration that uh, gives you some hints about how useful the use of these models are. When you cannot address experimentally everything, then you can narrow this using computational biology, hidden Markov models, and uh, this kind of uh, tools. So the conclusions here is that HMMs are very powerful tools to identify function in proteins and are very powerful tools to identify functions in unknown organisms. And I would like to mention here Sean Eddy, who is the guy who has developed all this uh, HMM in the framework of protein sequences. And thank to him, we can use uh, this kind of, uh, of, of concepts. And thank you very much for your attention. And I will be happy to answer any question if you have any.